G'day friends, welcome to today's YouTube video. My name is James. <laughs> Did my voice just break? Welcome back to my channel, welcome if you're new. Today's gonna be real time. Before I start, I just wanna show you this. Uh, this is my Virtual Voyage 8 journal, our Burtonville 2 course, and I, it's 8, right? I'm sure it was 8. Please tell me it was 8. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've done so many of them now, I just can't keep track. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff in here. I haven't flipped this yet. I'm hoping to flip this just before Halloween. And uh, I've just got a few finishing touches to put in here. Also, like, see, there's some blank space here. I'm going to try and fix some of the blank space, just so it looks really, really nice and finished. But this little guy here, I remember doing the course saying I would love to dive into this a little bit more. This is a total random, like, offshoot little thing that I did. Uh, it's inspired by Margaret Keane. So Virtual Voyage 8 was all about uh, Tim Burton inspiration. And one of the movies that I really, really love that Tim Burton directed was Big Eyes. And it's about the American artist Margaret Keane. Very fascinating story. And she did these big eyed waif paintings that became very, very famous in the commercial art scene. So, uh, and she recently passed away. Rest in peace, poor Margaret. So I feel like I want to dive into that because I said I was going to do it. So I should probably do it. Uh, <laughs> just in case, on the off chance, two people were wondering if I was ever going to do what I said I was going to do two months ago. Um, I'm really excited. I did a, a couple of like sketches before I started. I'm going to overlay that footage while I'm talking now, just so I get everything set up, but it is going to be real time. And in this journal, I did work in uh, loose sheets of paper, and then I kind of just used everything as ephemera to kind of put in. I've used some of these uh, printouts to kind of guide me along the way, because they are small world characters inspired by Margaret Keane. Uh, you know, I love my Disney and my crossovers, so I wanted to do that. And I picked a small world character that I actually don't think is in Disneyland anymore. P possibly they might be. I know Ariel got put in here, but in 1966, apparently, according to this picture I found on Google, um, there were mermaids in It's a Small World, and they're really fascinating. They have this diamond kind of harlequin print tail, really beautiful big head pieces. Uh, I love the color story there. And I would just love to dive into that inspiration. So in my little sketches, I did one of the mermaids from the 60s. I also did one of the Japanese girls in the kimono and the Dutch girl. I was experimenting with a few different styles, one that had a bit more of a realistic uh, kind of like baby doll body. Uh, it's got kind of like chubby arms and, you know, chubby belly and everything. Very soft and rounded that looked a little bit more... Uh, I guess, alive than the doll look of It's a Small World. And then I tried one where I blended a bit of a cartoony Mary Blair style together. Didn't really love that one. It looked a little too cartoony for me. And then the one that was inspired by the one that I did in my journal, which I would say looks most like the dolls. It's very static, very symmetrical, very uh, like a little wooden block doll or peg doll. You know how they're just very simple? So I tried that. I didn't like that either. I'm going to go with the first one that I did. It always happens that way, isn't it? You'd spend time doing a whole bunch of sketches, you go with the first one. So, I'm gonna do it real time. I haven't figured it all out, it's not all fleshed out, but I've got enough to start with. So if you wanna grab your pencil and some watercolor paper, I'm probably gonna watercolor it at the end. No idea how it's gonna turn out, but we'll go on that journey together. Let's grab a really light pencil, like if you've got a light lead, like an F or an H or an HB. Oh, this is an F, and this is uh, Criticolor Fine Graphite. I'm going to zoom you in, actually, so you can see what we're doing. Alrighty, here is the sketch. This this lovely lady here. She's based on these images I found on Google Image Search. There's a Mary Blair drawing there. Love, Mary. So we're going to do that. Don't know if the color scheme's going to be the same or if we might change it to be a bit more Halloween-y. I've got an eraser. Yes, got an eraser over here. We might need that. Uh, this is not going to be a tutorial on how to draw. Hopefully, if you've done any of my courses before, you've got the basics down. I'm just going to go through it, but I'll talk you through it. Um, maybe I'll demo a few things on the back of this paper if I feel like you need it, but just dive in. Dive in with confidence, I say. I'm going to start with a circle. I want to leave a little bit of a room at the top of the page because I need to put a headpiece on, which I forgot to do in my sketch. I'm starting with this circle. This is a Fabriano uh, Aquarelle watercolor. It's 300 GSM, cold press. Yeah, 1264 Fabriano. Just in case you wanted to know the brand, it's a little bit textured, very thick watercolor cardstock. I'm trying to be a little bit neater with my sketch today, so I'm going to go a bit slower. Hopefully that's good if you're following along as well. I'm going to put a line right down the middle of the face. This is going to be my center point for the, all the facial features. I'm going to start at the bottom of the face because 
the Mary Blant, no, the Mar Margaret Keane, I'm going to get them all confused now. Margaret Keane, if you look at some of these printouts I have, uh, they're all kind of the same face. I mean, I've got a different alternate here because this is more of an Asian monolid eye, but all the other faces kind of follow the same structure. You've got a really small chin. It does tend to point, it's more of a heart shaped at the bottom of the face. It's got that point um, and it flattens out towards the side of the eyes, uh, kind of around bulbous nose that just sticks right in the middle. There's no nose ridge or kind of, you know, the, like the, what's that called up the top? Nose ridge. Um, and then huge eyes. That's the whole thing, right? Margaret Keane was famous for the big eyes. So just picking out a few of those characteristics, we'll be able to kind of put that reference in. Um, but yeah, we want to start at the bottom because it's easier to put the mouth down here than to put the face on and then have to restructure everything. We will kind of do that anyway, but for now I'm just going to put down some ovals the rough size that I want everything. So I actually like to draw a pretty small mouth and the nose is just a little bit smaller than the mouth and it sits right on top. There's barely a space between them. Really like to smush the mouth, nose and chin all together, especially on these feminine faces. Gives them a really delicate, cute little jaw. And then I'm just gonna space out the eyes. I'm putting these big circles on. These essentially become the iris. I want them to run just a little lower than the top of the nose. So I don't like to put my eyes too far up. I also like to squish them down. It gives them a bigger forehead, which also makes them look a little bit cuter. And I put some of that other inspiration that I like from Rune Naito, who was a Japanese illustrator around the same time in the 60s. He has a very distinct style. It is very cute and has big foreheads. There we go. So I'm just putting this, the rough sizing on and I'm going to, I guess, actually just put the features on because that's I kind of like them where they are. I'll give you a quick rundown of the features. Just uh, slow this down if you really want to know. The mouth, we start with the middle. So if I've got that oval there to show you how big the mouth is, we're going to cut right through the middle to start and we'll put up a little bump like a U and then we'll put two little hills. So you've got like a really flattened out M shape there. And then when we get to the side, we're going to softly corner up and put a little bit of a, an extra bit of uh, shading in that corner. That's going to be the corner of the mouth. And they usually create like this little shadow in that corner. For the bottom of the lip, you're going to kind of follow that shape that we already sketched out, the oval. And for the top, you just want to go right through the center and put that same dip that you have in the middle up the top for the cupid's bow and round off down to the edge. We don't want it down to the edge of this dark area. We actually want it just before that starts because remember that's a little corner mouth shadow. So we'll attach it to the line down here. I don't always attach all these lines and typically when I shade, the top lip is gonna be a little bit darker than the bottom lip. Sometimes the bottom lip, I'll leave a little bit of an area unshaded. And if you want to add a little bit of extra detail, start through the center and you're going to put brackets on and just think of your hands going like this. So this is the center of the lip. As the brackets go, we're going to open up and that's the shape they're going to be. So they always face outwards. I'm going to put them in kind of heavier so you can see. And this is just a very simplified version of this, but it'll give your lips some dimension. If you put them in really, really lightly, it just adds like a nice extra bit of fullness to the lip but I would probably still leave some of that bottom lip unshaded right through the center. So there's a quick lip. I'll do the nose since I'm here and then I'll just kind of put them all on. That nose we had just above. I actually start with the nostrils. We have a dip right in the middle that kind of follows the Cupid's bow dip and then two slightly diagonal, I think of them as apostrophes. Like, you know, when you've got an apostrophe shape like this, it's a little bit thicker and then it tapers down. So you kind of put those apostrophes on the sideways. It's a little bit thinner towards the middle and then it tapers out and it's a little bit thicker towards the outside. And you've already got that oval that kind of depicts how wide the nose in, nose in, the nose is. You just want to notch out the brackets on the side and do a little bit of a shading that's kind of like a crescent moon. Is that even the right way to say it? Probably not. You want to shade so that there's a bit of an open oval at the top. This actually becomes the tip of the nose highlight. So you kind of just go from bracket to bracket and shade all across the bottom in a bit of a band. 
So those are the nose and mouth details, but they're really, really small. By the time you get them on here, you, really, you don't even need to worry too much about all of the detail, unless you're just going to be really, really specific with it. But I'm just going to be a little bit free and easy today. The thing that I would say I make the mistake of most is going too heavy with the nostrils. Which is fine, if you're using a pencil you can just erase it. Everything is just a lot more delicate than you think. When you sketch it out and you're practicing, we tend to go really, really bold and make bold choices, which is good. But then when you go and put it on here, it can suddenly look like your face is being overwhelmed by detail. Even with all these little lines running through the face, I don't really need those anymore. I'll kind of clean them up. It might help to use a mechanical pencil as well. I usually would use a mechanical pencil, but the lead I have in that one is really dark, and I don't want a dark outline, so it's just going to be what it is. And now the eyes. I'm going to start by kind of etching in from the inner corner, so where the nose is, to the top outer corner. And you can see I'm almost... I want to say I'm squaring it off, but it's still really, really round. I think of my circle... Like, this is the pupil and the iris. I think of it in a box, like this. And so what I'm doing is I'm starting down at this corner and I'm trying to end up at this corner, but I have to follow the curve around. So this is how you kind of, uh, like, almond that eye in. You don't want to go up to this here, none of that matters anymore. But I, I like to think of it that way because if I just do this without thinking of the box, sometimes I can start in here and end in here and I, it's just the same circle. I actually want to pull it out a little bit, both edges. So that's what I mean by squaring it off. It's such a random way to put it, but it makes sense in my head that way. And then we follow the curve on the outside. We get those really big, beautiful almond eyes. The first circle that we did, we're kind of going over that again. There should be such little white space in these eyes. The Margaret Keane eyes are just all iris and pupil. So we don't really need a lot of white space. I'm gonna put another circle, so we're just doing concentric circles, one inside the other, inside that one, and I'm gonna shade the whole thing with graphite, except for one teeny tiny little dot right in the top left-hand corner. So I'll just draw that in so I know not to go over it. This doesn't have to be done well, because you can go back in and add your details later. But I do like to shade the pupil in because it just gives me that Margaret Keane feeling while I'm going, and sometimes you like to see where you're gonna end up. And if you're missing some face details, I find it, it's just it's just hard to see that. So just shade that in quickly. So we've got a good perspective on how we're going. I think that looks great. I think that's very Margaret Keane. I think that's as much as we need. She does have a double lid. So we'll put that line that just follows the top curve of the eye, or the eyelid crease, I should say. And I'm also gonna put a soft line on the outside. It's almost half the eye, really. A few little scribbles, they're just gonna be the eyebrows. The eyebrows are very nondescript on a Margaret Keane, I feel like, so they don't need to be fully etched in too much. And there's our face. I'm gonna start the next step uh, by kind of restructuring the jaw and the head shape. Now this is the part that I find I fiddle with the most and if the camera's off, I could be doing this for minutes. But how I generally approach it is I start at the chin, right? I still want that really smooshed chin, mouth, nose ratio. I think I like where it is here. I should always do this left first. I'm right-handed, so if I, do, if I do this on the right and then I try to do it on the left, I can't see what I'm doing, so I should always start on the left, but I never do. I'll do it this time. <laughs> I'm going to softly curve up to the outside of the eye. Now, if I do this really round, it's going to look softer and a little bit younger. If I start to angle this in, and it's such a slight difference, but it makes all the world of difference really in the end. If I start to flatten this off and sharpen it, it's going to look a little bit more mature and older. I vary, like I oscillate between which I prefer, and usually if I just like the look of it, I go with it. I don't care about the age that it's reading, but 
it can just be a little bit tricky on this step. I'm going to lightly erase everything and just kind of have a couple of goes at it, I feel like. Sometimes I also like to start from the side of the head because it flattens off on the side of the head. So see how we started with that circle? Now we've just shaved in. And technically your cheekbone sits right under your eye. So that's where this, the change in direction starts to happen, just under the eye. And again, if it sharpens off, then you've got that really sharp jaw look, which you don't tend to see in babies. <laughs> so that's why if you just keep it a little bit softer, it reads a little bit younger. But how you structure the jaw just really changes the whole effect. Someone's getting rescued. You gotta love downtown. So this just becomes a whole bunch of erasing for me. Get my little, little broom. It's not really going to matter on the sides of the face because for this mermaid, her hair covers it. But I think I'm just, yeah, I need to just wing it out a little bit. She's going to go softer, I think. You don't want to erase it too many times because then you start to destroy the integrity of the paper surface. So just try not to be too pedantic. I get really crazy with it though. It's just, I feel like it makes such a difference. And especially if I've got an image I like, like I really like her jaw, so I can see it's flatter. I'm just gonna have to live with it. I think the difference here is the hair. So I'm gonna let the hair fix any of the problems I think I have with the jaw. So let's leave that for now. Might extend her forehead a little bit because I do like that large forehead look. And for now, I'm just gonna put a bit of a uh, U-shape just at the top to uh, reference her bangs. So as long as there's some space between the eyebrows and bangs, I think I'll be good to go. All right, I'm gonna put the neck on, a little bit of a J or a candy cane hook shape. And I like to start just where the eyes meet in the middle. So it's a bit of a thicker neck than I would usually do, but these are supposed to be a little bit younger and chubbier. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just getting over a sinus infection. So if you can hear that, that's what's going on. I'm going to put a bit of a U shape, so it's almost like this neck becomes a bit of an apron or a teardrop. This, I know this is kind of weird, but for these kind of baby doll bodies, they have like this little pouchy stomach, and I just like to put it in first so I feel like I can get the sizing right, the proportions, because it needs to be quite foreshortened. Like even this, I think, is maybe a little too much. We need to emphasize how big and lollipop-like the head is, so we can't have the body be too big, otherwise it makes everything else look smaller. So I'm just gonna fiddle with that for a second. Uh, it just looks really bizarre, but I think that's about it. And then I'm gonna run through the side. Now this is a mermaid, so we're actually just gonna draw a tail down to a point. I'm gonna have it slightly wing off to the side. Again, the shorter and chubbier, the younger it will look. So this one kind of looks a little bit older than the one that I'm currently drawing. And I don't mind having the difference, but just keep that in mind. If you are if you feel like yours looks too old, squish it and chubby it up. If you're feeling like it looks too young, lean it out a little bit, sharpen it up a little bit. And I feel like this is the tail that's on the image. I think I'm just going to keep that. Right when I get to the bottom of the mermaid tail, you can see I've kind of S-curved tapered this side in. You want to cross, just keep those lines going. This big old banana curve on this side, and this slight S-curve this side. This is actually going to be the inside tail, that little triangle dip there. And you're going to pick two points that just come out before that, and put some nice S-curves. that mirror each other. Try not to pay too much attention to this little bit down here. You only want a really little triangle that crosses over. And you're gonna do the same thing. Those S curves to meet the edge of your tail. I feel like everything always needs a little bit of finessing. To me, I think that tail is actually too wide. So I'm gonna make this a little smaller. I think if the fin looks really small, 
it makes the whole mermaid look cuter. That's my theory anyway. But I don't typically draw fins like this. I used to all the time, but I've since switched how I like my mermaid fins. I think that's cuter. All right. Also going to draw a triangle right in the middle. Her scales on these pictures are this Harlequin diamond print. So I'm gonna start with that middle triangle and then extend the diagonal lines all the way down. Excuse me while I cough for a second. <laughs> I'll take a sip of water. <coughs> when I extend that all the way down, I'm gonna start another triangle off to the side here. And now this one extends all the way down as well. This is how I can get those three triangles kind of on the hip area nicely. And then everything kind of goes from there. So once you've got that, that distance between those, you just repeat it. And you can eyeball it, it doesn't have to be perfect. I wouldn't get a ruler out for it. Usually your eyeballs will do a good job of keeping it pretty even. And also it doesn't need to follow the tail. Like you don't need to follow the curve of the tail, just put it on flat. I don't think it really matters for this. And then three lines on a diagonal through the tail, uh, the fin. I believe it's called the fluke, actually, this part. All right. Now, we're gonna need to put little arms on. Before I do that, I'm gonna slightly dip. So where we had this body come out, I'm gonna slightly dip in. I don't know what you would call it, but I also think of this as like a gourd shape. So you know how gourds, those pumpkin things, are like this? Or a babushka, one of those little Matroshka dolls, whatever they're called, um, like this shape. This is what I want the body to look like. The shoulders are gonna sit here, here's the hips and the tail. The reason I want this is because it just also accentuates her little pancita, her little belly, and it also uh, gives her a teeny tiny waist. Like, it's not gonna be a snatched waist because she's supposed to look young and babies aren't corseted like that, but it just kind of helps shape that body Again, I'm thinking more of like a plastic baby doll, like a baby born. Do you remember those? Do you remember that ad? Baby born, baby born. <laughs> How do I still know that? All right. So from here, I'm going to round off. It's just a really simple um, bit of an S curve on the top and then the arm that just floats out the bottom from the side. I'm going to put this hand on. I won't break this hand down because I'm not even going to draw it correctly, but put a little oval there and a, <laughs> two little ovals. If you're struggling with a hand, sometimes just an oval and a smaller oval for the thumb is all you need to make it look like a hand. And then the other arm I'm keeping a little bit closer to her body. What you will notice is I've made the shoulders really soft and rounded and very narrow, but this forearm is gets a lot chubbier. So that's another feature that would make her look a little younger and a little cuter. Excuse me again, that arm is way too long. <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to talk through this whole thing because I'm losing my voice. I'm not losing it, but I'm losing the ability to speak without coughing, which is just not gonna work. I thought I was fine. It's, I've been struggling with it for like four days now. I've had this sinus infection and I've still been dancing and going to work and it's, it's Steve's birthday. Like there was just a whole bunch of stuff going on all at once, which was fine. I was really happy to do it all, but it's just hard to do that when you're not feeling a hundred percent. And it's not like it was something that like really took me out. It was just annoying. I had all the nasal drip, I had the coughing, like there was constantly this little tickle in my throat from all the nasal drip. It just, it was, it was a lot anyway. That's fine. We'll keep her like that. Maybe it's this arm that's a little too big as well. Just like smaller, chubbier arms. That's it. Just move the hand up a little bit and that should fix that issue. All right. It doesn't really matter. I mean, that gourd shape that we kind of etched in is not really gonna matter too much. She's gonna have a necklace that comes over 
her chest area just so we can keep her modest. And I'm going to do that by putting some various sized pearls. I like to make the pearls a little bit smaller and cross the shoulders when they get up to the neck. And then just fill in the extra areas with smaller pearls. Looks like bubbles. Erase anything that's underneath. Love that. And we'll put on her hair. You can put her belly button on, but I actually think at this point that first scale kind of covers it, so maybe not. But if you do have a bit of extra space for the belly, you can pop a little belly button in. I've got a shade underneath her jaw. A little U filled with some scribbled shading just to separate the neck from the face. Excuse me. <coughs> <laughs> All right, lovely. We need hair and a headpiece. So I'm going to start with this little bang up the top. I, I kind of like it all the swooping this way. It has this nice kind of, uh, what do you call it? Like those C fan type things. I don't know, just kind of worked. So I'm going to start in the middle with this bracket that brackets out to the right. So all of the hair on this side, all these strands will be kind of facing the right in a normal kind of bang formation, like a fringe. But as you get past the center, you're gonna have to elongate those strokes out to the edge. And this is what kind of gives it that sweep. Typically you would flip the curve so that, and like we did, um, like how I explained the lips, you would go all this way. And then once you get past center, you go all that way for a bang. But for this one, we're just going all the way around like that. Gives it a nice little swoop, a bit of motion to it. There we go. And then right through the center here, we're just going to bump up ever so slightly and run the hair across. Oh, this looks like those animators dolls. You know the Disney animators dolls? The big baby doll ones, they're super cute. I wonder, I wonder if they're inspired by Margaret Keane. I know a lot of baby dolls have huge eyes because babies are attracted to that, but Makes you wonder now that I'm looking at it. Um, so I'm going to stop there for a second. What I actually want to do is cut into the face. I think this is going to solve a myriad of problems I have with the structure of this face. It's got to just cut through the side of the eye because I want the ba I want the hair to look like it's falling forward. So I'm going to give it a really slight curve to cut through the side of that eye just hope that it's going to look good. Same thing on this side. Not through, I, it's basically cutting off the whites on the side. You don't really want to cut off too much of the pupil and the iris. And for this part, this tendril, I'm actually going to sweep it onto the chest. Can you see this little extra bit I've got down here? Sometimes it helps to erase as you go, just so you don't get too confused by all of the lines everywhere and I'm going to do the same thing and just lightly erase whatever's on the side of those strands. This lost its cap. Well I didn't lose it, I've got it, but it just doesn't work anymore. So I have to push it up like that. I'm going to shave in the sides of the head. This is a 60s uh, kind of, or this, I mean the mermaid that we're referencing is from the 60s and the 60s it, it was all kind of very sleek, mod, uh, it, it's not a bob really, but there's like a certain length to it that I feel like was very 60s that kind of hit just below the shoulders. I actually redrew how long this hair was after I first sketched it because I thought it just didn't look 60s properly. But, <coughs> excuse me, you want it to be pretty flat to the side of the head. Think Jan Brady. And then slightly winged out. I almost said winged out. <laughs> As if that was the past tense of wing. and curve it in just, I mean, at this point, it's kind of where that elbow is, but just a little higher than that. And if you want to add a little bit more fullness, you add it down the bottom here. Try to keep everything up the top really close to the head, like as close to the head shape as possible. So it looks really nice and flat and it kind of looks more weighted, the hair. If the hair is pulling down that it's flat on top, it kind of looks like it's heavier at the bottom and that's what you want with all this bulk. 
Also, if you've got these curves on the face and they're too curved, it can look like it's a little uh, light and weightless. So you might want to just straighten those out a little bit if you want it to look a little heavier at the bottom. It all depends. I mean, she's a mermaid. She could just have that weightless look. But this is another one of those things that I would give myself some time to fiddle with. And because we're sketching... Wow, I'm losing my voice <laughs> because we're sketching. <laughs> because we're sketching, just erase as you go. Sometimes the extra sketch lines are so forgiving and you actually don't know that you've drawn a few lines that you don't like until you've cleaned it up. So if you're going to do a clean final image, if you're not going to rest with the sketch, uh, if you're going to clean it all up and paint it, just make sure you do erase what you think is not going to be there in the end so you can get a pretty good visual on how you're going. Like, I think this is going pretty well. It's got a bit of a different, like, it's just younger. I think she's the younger sister of this one. Because this one definitely is a little longer, it's a little leaner. This one, I made it more short and stout, and I think you can see the age difference there. But there are some giveaways for, well, not giveaways, but there are some things you can do that will just make the age more ambiguous. I think stylizing the figure too much can make it super ambiguous. Uh, like giving it a really tiny waist would really confuse the age. Uh, hair is a big one because on a toddler-ish age, you wouldn't expect to see such full hair or even a certain hairstyle. Uh, just might not be age appropriate for the age you might be thinking. I don't mind the ambiguity. It's a mermaid. She's from It's a Small World. I don't think she has to be any specific age, but if it's one of those things you consider, like you're trying to draw your children or your grandchildren or someone in your family or you're trying to reference someone specific, those are the things with age that can get a little uh, confusing. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, I think we're done. I have to love and leave you at this point, I think, because I don't think I'll get through it. I'm actually just going to paint it. I'm going to finish it all up and uh, probably scan it for Collage Club and then pop all of these, I would say. Maybe just her and her. Oh, I didn't put a headpiece on. Joking. I'll leave you after the headpiece, but I will film myself finishing it so that we can have a nice uh, paint together. We'll see if I can muster up a voice to kind of voice over that, but I'm just going to guess that I won't. So <laughs> I'm going to put this headpiece on and I, I, mean, I don't know which one to reference. They're all kind of coral headpieces. I like how kind of abstract they are. I might just draw these random curvy banana looking spikes and then add some cutouts in there. For coral, I used to draw coral a lot. Um, I would draw these amorphous shapes and then I would just go and add cutouts in the middle. And I felt like it always kind of worked. Like I think that's good. I don't want it to be too detailed because nothing else on this is too detailed. So you don't want to suddenly add like a super detailed headpiece if, you know, the scales are a flat diamond pattern. It's just one of those things to think about when you're blending styles or you're using references. Sometimes you can reference an artist that works in great detail and you can also reference another artist that works with no detail and try to find a happy medium might be very confusing. So you got to make your, you know, artistic choices at those points, but I'm really happy with how she turned out. I'm going to just fix up this tendril. I want it to kind of end at the same point that all this hair ends. If you want it a little bit more wispy, you can add a few extra pieces that don't connect to that kind of mass of hair at the bottom. If you add them at different lengths, it can look very layered. That can also help break it up a bit. But I think it's great. I love her. I love it. I love Mary Blair, who is credited for a lot of uh, the success of It's a Small World and its aesthetic, along with Rolly Crump. Rest in peace to him too. He passed away recently, I believe. And then Margaret Keane. Love her. Tim Burton. I love all of it. I mean, it's obviously why I'm doing it, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, oh, maybe I can just, oh, look, I'll try and, right now I'm going to overlay all of the uh, watercoloring footage. I'll give myself about a minute just to speak to you before I wrap it all up and hopefully that will be a nice little video for you. Thank you so much for spending the time with me live. Now I'm going to do one more cough and then I'll speak. Hang on. <laughs> mm -mm -mm. Oh, goodness. Don't you love it? Um...
I have been having such a wonderful time at dancing. It's really surreal because uh, I'm in the fifth week of the run, but I think next week is the last one, and I'm super depressed about it already because it has been so, so much fun. And if you've been seeing, obviously I've been spamming my Instagram with lots of pictures and videos of the blind tiger and the tiger tail dances at Not Scary Farm, but I just love it. It's so much fun. I've had so many times where there's just random people in the audience that I didn't know were going to be there that I know from Disneyland or I like just friends that have come by and you know sometimes they tell me they're going to be there but sometimes I just don't know or it's just super fun. I've, I've loved interacting with the guests and having like I mean there's just so many magical moments and it's kind of cliche to say that about <laughs> performance but you just do, you have these moments where you look into the audience and you see all these people dancing and enjoying themselves and interacting and like they're creating these very memorable experiences and you really feel like you get to be a part of that in such a unique way. And sometimes I have to remind myself like, oh, I've got a job to do, I should be dancing. Like, don't just stand there and watch people. <laughs> but it, I get really, really sidetracked. It's been super, super fun. Um, I've lost 15 pounds since I've started, which is so wonderful. I always knew my issue is that I just needed to dance again. <laughs> I think I never made a secret of that. But um, yeah, I've loved it. I think the only downside to anything is that I just don't have as much time to do all of my art and journaling. And I take it with me. And there are times where I do it as well. And I have actually been doing a lot of drawing. And I've been drawing a lot of things that I think I'm just inspired by because of the experience I'm having. But a lot of them are inside jokes, or I'm just drawing like the dancers in, you know, just these different 1920s type art deco illustrations. And I'm still doing it all, obviously. But, um, you know, it's just different. I think I was always going to notice the difference of splitting my time. And I had this last year through Christmas. Um, but even then I felt like, I think even then I felt like I still had a lot of time. It wasn't a ton. <laughs> I think this particular season, I don't think I've ever been so full time, like, and the hours are just super weird. So I, I don't get home until like two o'clock in the morning. So it's really hard to wake up early and start all my JLB creative stuff. And even though I've managed it, um, I've definitely noticed the extra commitment I've had to put in to keep it all going. And I have noticed that like I push things right back to the last minute, which is just not typically what I do. Um, but you know what? I'm, I'm just going to pat myself on the back for still doing it anyway, because, uh, yeah, I mean, the alternative would have been worse, <laughs> actually just not doing it at all. And I, I just really, I still love it all. I just wish I had 29 hours in a day. If I could do that, I think I'd be super happy, but nonetheless, I am really, really happy. And I uh, hope that you enjoyed some of this drawing half tutorial, let's call it. Um, it was never supposed to be a tutorial, but hopefully you had a good time drawing along. And I think, you know what, I, I do want to do more of these Margaret Keane things. I'm not sure what I'll do in my free time uh, later, if I find any, but I think I would want to do some, oh, it's so hard. I want to do some that are Halloween-y, but I feel like obviously Halloween will end. And so anything I share uh, for a college club or anything. I mean, maybe people will still be doing their Halloween stuff afterwards. I'm not quite sure. I still love the big eyes, Margaret Keane thing. I'm really into that right now. I'm also really into 1920s again. I've been revisiting my virtual voyage three, where we did the, the red curtain cruise, all the stuff that we did for the great Gatsby, all of that kind of art deco inspiration. I've been revisiting that to use as reference for the stuff that I've been doing. So that's where I am right now. And obviously very big Halloween mood. Very split though, because I have been in rehearsals for Christmas as well. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit chaotic in my brain. I'm definitely feeling like I've got multiple personalities. I've got this spooky Halloween side that I never knew I really had. I'm getting so much better with the monsters too. I don't know if I, I, I think the last update was that I'm really desensitizing. I think I'm almost fully desensitized. I might also go into a maze at some point. Like, you know, I might go into a haunted house. Who knows? Big leaps forward for me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, love it. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you, everyone who has uh, been supporting along in that journey and to those people who have made it out to see us perform at Knott's Scary Farm. I look forward to sharing more of my performances with you online. Also, Steve had a birthday party. I don't know if we told you this. I don't know if I told you this. He had a birthday party. Happy birthday, Steve. He wanted to have a photo shoot, like supermodel photo shoot extravaganza a la Stephen Marzell for his birthday. So the invitations were really cute. They were a call sheet, like a 
a photo, like an editorial call sheet. And so we essentially gave them to everyone, like they were the models that had to show up for the day and everyone came kind of dressed to impress and ready to be photographed. And he just put them on his Instagram. So go and check out uh, his Instagram. It was so fun. Like everyone came and we had all these clothes out and all these things you could style with and Steve was shooting and then Steve was getting in the photos. We knew they were going to be black and white from the start. So it was just like, put anything on, have your Linda Evangelista moment. And then he just ended up with a whole bunch of really super fun, kind of crazy photos of all of his friends. And I think it was just such an incredible way to snapshot like your friendships. And I don't know, there are just photos in there that I feel like he'll cherish forever. And him loving photography so much, I love photography so much. It was just a really, really sentimental, you know, wonderful way to kind of capture that moment in time. So really interesting idea for a party that I've kind of always wanted to do. So it was interesting to see it all play out. It was a lot more work than I expected. <laughs> I think you got to, you got to just accept that a few of you will just be working the event. Um, but I, yeah, I would love to do that for my party one day. I think it was just so much fun. You know, I love playing top models. So that was really cute. Go and have a look at his Instagram if you want to go and see that. Otherwise, I will catch you again soon. I'm looking to finish up my virtual voyage journal and flip it. Uh, for Halloween. So be on the lookout for that. I usually do a chatty flip and then a non chatty flip, just music only for people who don't want to listen to me ramble. Hopefully I'll have my voice back by then and uh, I'll see you then. Bye everyone.